Great unsolved robberies make for great unsolved stories. Take D.B. Cooper, the famed bandit who, from 1971 until the events of September 11, 2001, was the focal point of the United States' most notorious skyjacking. Still at large and quite possibly deceased, only remnants of the $200,000 he got away with were ever found. One of our earliest episodes, which we revisited due to something like new developments, involved the supposed lost Union gold in central Pennsylvania. Neither of these are likely to be solved, and that, in part, is what keeps the stories alive and ripe for the development of folklore. Though I will say that the lost Union gold will never be solved because all evidence points to that it never existed in the first place and was a creation of writers of tall tales. In central Pennsylvania, in the wee hours of a late summer morning in 1909, a train was robbed by a single man brandishing two pistols. Like D.B. Cooper, only remnants of his haul was found years after the fact. This is the story of the number 39 robbery. It was early in the morning of August 31st, 1909. The moon and the stars were still out and I've always thought of those couple hours between the closing of the bars and the arrival of the garbage and dairymen as a wonderful blanket when to be awake and walking is a simple joy. Regardless, it was in those wee hours that a train carrying a significant load of money including gold and most notably pennies was making its way through the steep and winding Lewistown Narrows. The Narrows are a cut between two mountains which the Juniera River passes between. South of the river, the rail line hugs the bank. To the north of the river is where Route 322-22 now runs between Lewistown in the west and Mifflin Town in the east. The train had left a station in Harrisburg at about midnight. Its cars contained more than $150,000 by contemporary accounts. Also, there were several cars of passengers, most of whom were likely asleep at this hour, riding on an old coal engine known as the Pittsburgh Express, or the number 39. The train rolled on slowly through the starlit summer morning, passing Mifflin around 1.20 in the morning, heading west toward Pittsburgh. As the train came to the center of the Narrows, a few miles before the Junietta swings northward into Lewistown, about where the hamlet of Hawstone sits, explosions were felt at the front of the train. The explosions shattered some of the glass and significantly damaged the engine itself. Bringing the train to a stop, the crew were about to inspect the situation when a man covered in a sack that hung below his waist boarded the train. In each hand he held a revolver and he ordered the men still. There's a good deal of confusion regarding some of the following as the accounts in the papers differ. The conductor of the train came to the front and in a moment of demands and shouting was apparently shot through one of his hands. The lone robber regained control of the situation and brought more dynamite which he'd had in his pockets. Brandishing the dynamite, some passengers along with the conductor were ordered back to the passenger cars. Okay. There is a lot of confusion here, so just let me continue in saying that take a lot of this with a grain of salt, but there is considerable debate as to how things proceeded from there. Some sources state that the train robber ordered the crew through the cars that held the money. Other sources state that since the safe combinations were unknown to the crew members, Robert utilized nitroglycerin to surgically detonate the locks. If this is true, it could possibly have helped narrow down the list of suspects since this is a delicate operation and often enough a person attempting such a maneuver would often be seriously injured. So volatile is nitroglycerin that they would often be killed. Yet other sources dispute this claim and state that the safes were opened by one of the crew members who had access to a key. Either seems likely as it is not disputed that the robber utilized explosives to bring the train to a stop. So is the use of nitroglycerin that big of a stretch? Maybe, 
maybe not. Admittedly, I don't know about uh, nitroglycerin enough to say for sure. The bottom line is the robber got the money off the train. He appeared to be operating alone. He ordered two of the train crew to carry the money up the side of a wooded mountain where it was left and then a robber allowed the train and all aboard to leave. Despite the damages received in the initial explosions, the train was able to complete its journey to Pittsburgh. The Lewistown Sentinel reported that many of the train's sleeping passengers arrived in Pittsburgh unaware that their train had been robbed. The paper would go on to note that, quote, the actual amount taken from the train did not exceed $5,250. And 5,190 of this amount had been recovered and that gold bars had been found hidden in an old tree. It would seem that in the end, the robber got away with about $60, most of it in newly minted pennies. So let's, uh, let's come back to this in a second. From the first... There was mystery surrounding this train robbery. That region, in fact, had been the haunt of a famous highwayman in the early 19th century until his death in 1820 in Belfont, Center County. The famed Davy Lewis had been a highwayman in that region. Davy Lewis may be the most famous of these old Pennsylvania highwaymen, and over the years, he's developed a Robin Hood sort of reputation, and there are tales of his lending money to poor farmers in order to spare them from eviction, only to get that money back when he would rob the local authorities as they returned from collecting the back tax from the farmers. Those who were on the train when it was robbed reported that there was a phantom light moving across the river from the train. The investigators felt that this might mean that the robber may have had an accomplice, and some of the authorities suspect that the light could have been from an automobile. But I don't know if this was ever proven, and in 1909, an automobile would likely be uh, quite a scene, especially in central Pennsylvania. So there's all this mystery surrounding not only the robbery itself, but even the area in which it occurred. As the sun came up in the morning, a group of men began investigating the area of the robbery. This is when the gold was found in the hollow of a tree. Also, many pennies had fallen out of a sack which had a tear in it. The gunny sack which the robber had worn was found not far from the site of the robbery. And although bloodhounds were brought in, the scent was not able to be picked up because too many had been around the site in, during the investigation, as the dogs were not able to be there until later in the day. And those dogs were never able to discern the robber scent from those of the investigators. But the initial investigation was fairly successful, maybe not in apprehending the suspect, but... All but some $60 uh, were retrieved, and that money, that 60 some dollars, was uh, presumed to be in pennies by and large. And again, the identity of the suspect had not been determined, though understandably suspected that a former railroad worker could be the culprit or at least an accessory, as the robber was clearly aware of the cash and money aboard the number 39. There were rumors circulating, too, that some tramp had been seen in and around the Narrows, but nothing more is known to have come from such stories. On September 3, 1909, just a few days after the train robbery, the thief struck again. A husband and wife from Lewistown were near the rail tracks just outside of town inspecting land parcels for their lumber business. As they returned to their wagon, a man in blue overalls wearing a gunny sack came forward raising a revolver. They did not have much money on hand, which he had demanded, and the robber ordered them then onto the ground. Shortly thereafter, a couple of ladies passed by, and the thief also ordered them to the ground and was only able to secure a few dollars before fleeing into the forest, he stole the man's hat. The next morning, a lumber worker was returning to town from his camp when he came across the suspect's hideout in the woods. Not only was there a man seen hiding there, but the gunny sack hood was also present. 
The lumber worker rode his horse to notify the authorities. A party, including dogs, were mustered in the region southeast of Lewistown in an area known as Bixler's Gap, where the Licking Creek runs was combed. And although they found items belonging to the robber, including another gunny sack, they were never able to make an arrest. And I'm skipping over quite a few details here. This is in part because there seems to be plenty of confusion uh, between contemporary accounts and the later writings in which I've read, and I'm trying not to get things too muddy. There are multiple people arrested, though, in the wake of all this, and there was a pretty sizable manhunt. But all of these people were released due to a lack of evidence and the inability for the victims to be able to identify the suspects as the man who robbed the train or the man who robbed the four people near the train tracks outside of Lewistown. On September 11, 1909, with the vast majority of the money having been recovered and no one being killed, the Lewistown Sentinel reported, quote, Frustrated at every turn to capture the man who held up the express train in the Narrows, and subsequently, it is believed, robbed Robert F. Little of Lewistown while passing along the mountain road near Doe Through Hollow. The large force of railroad and Adams Express detectives have abandoned the search in the mountains in which the robberies occurred. Though he'd successfully pulled off the robbery and gotten away undiscovered, the job was clearly not very professional judging by how clumsy things were with getting the money off the mountain. There is an interesting side note here, a possible suspect. See, there was another highwayman almost 100 years after the death of Pennsylvania's famed Davy Lewis who I'd mentioned earlier. Around 1900, there was James Lawler. That is a tough name for me to say. Let me try it again. Lawler. L-A-W-L-E-R. And though he is best known by that name, which I have a difficult time saying, there are those who suspect that his birth name to be James Lewis. Unlikely any relation to Davy Lewis, but it's worth noting just the same. Regardless, James Lawler was known to the authorities, having been arrested for robbery in Williamsport in 1897 or 1898. He was well known for robbing post offices in particular throughout the central region of the Commonwealth. And he had been in prison for a time in Pittsburgh's Western Penitentiary, which, which stood a stone's throw from the National Aviary. Released in 1903 with no known record of being in custody at the time of the train robbery, there is some writing that a train worker, seeing a photograph of Lawler, believed him to resemble a man he had seen in the region of the Narrows days prior to the robbery. Though, like with many things I've said today, this should be taken with a grain of salt, as I could find no contemporary account of this. But, but, Lawler was not heard from again following the number 39 robbery. Those who believe he was involved in a robbery feel that he either won died in the mountains while trying to elude authorities, or two, having bungled up so badly in the Narrows, resumed his career of crime in another region under another name, or perhaps even turned to a more lawful way of life, albeit probably also in another region and with another alias. 45 years, 45 years after the train robbery, a group of hunters found about $37 worth of pennies, all dating back to 1909, about 500 feet up the mountain from the train track. That's, that's a little more than half of what the robber was originally thought to have gotten away with. Earlier, I drew comparison to D.B. Cooper. It was this specific incident of finding some of the stolen money that made me think of much. As a youth nearly 10 years after the skyjacking in 1980, found a good bit of that ransom money along a river bank while camping with family. But like the D.B. Cooper incident, there's still a bit of money that has yet to be recovered and a deceased mystery man, well almost certainly deceased in Cooper's case. Either way, there's a mystery man who has yet to be identified and with each passing decade, it is increasingly doubtful that either will ever be revealed. 
But to this day, there are those who claim that the Narrows are still haunted by the train robber who walks around, identified by a faint light above the train line in the forest, either waiting for or looking for riches nearly obtained by the passing Pittsburgh Express, the famed number 39.